As the choir members return to their pews, I encourage you to turn your attention to our featured lectionary text this morning. It's Mark 1, verses 29 to 39. The gospel account we're about to read takes place shortly after Jesus has shown his power over a demon. Mark races through a day in the life of Jesus as a reporter might race a candidate through a day of political campaign appearances. The race continues in this morning's text with Mark introducing us to the first deacon in the New Testament, Simon's mother-in-law. She is healed by Jesus and then responds by serving those gathered in her home. The root word for deacon is diakonio, which means to serve. Those serving communion today are individually called deacons and collectively called diaconate. You're invited now to follow along on the screen or in the Bible in your pews as I read this morning's gospel text. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door, and he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. Uh, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go on to neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came to do. And he went through Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Thank you, Susie. May God grant us wisdom and understanding. Another sermon that has demons in it. If you missed last week, um, I encourage you to get online and, and listen to it because I'm not going to go into any great detail right now about demons and, and our take on that or my take on that uh, last week, but I encourage you to do that. Last Sunday we were in a synagogue and today we're in Simon and Andrew's house and Simon's mother-in-law is sick in bed there and Mark doesn't say that she has an unclean spirit like the man that Jesus healed last week. He just says that she has a fever, and um, that's preventing her from being able to work. So Jesus grabs her hand firmly and raises her up. And this is the same verb, raises her up, or raised up, that Mark uses later in his gospel when referring to Jesus in the 16th chapter when Jesus is resurrected. Listen to what happens next. She serves. And Jesus doesn't ask her to do it. Nowhere does Mark say, Jesus healed her so that she could serve a bunch of lazy men. Uh, it's not in there. Jesus heals her, and she can't help but serve. My sense is out of gratitude for feeling well, being made whole. Uh, it's not lost on me that this is the first deacon, a servant, as, as Susie explained, recorded in Mark's gospel and isn't it interesting that it's a woman? Simon and the other disciples won't understand the significance of this servant being raised up until Easter when Jesus is raised up. At this point, the disciples have really no apparent passion to serve others, nor do they understand that the Son of God came to serve and to give his life for all. Surely they would have a better understanding of Jesus and this whole, uh, you know, his identity and what he's called to do if Jesus wasn't so secretive 
about everything, at least in the Gospel of Mark. And why is it that secrecy is so important to Jesus? Last Sunday, the the man with the unclean spirit said to Jesus, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus says, shh, be silent. Why? Why does Jesus say, be silent and come out of them? Why does Jesus not want people to know? In today's text, Jesus, we're told, casts out many demons, and yet he doesn't permit them to speak. Why? Because they know who he is. Well, isn't that the point? Wouldn't Jesus want everybody to know who he is? In Mark's gospel, the demons know who Jesus is, and nobody else does. How ironic. You would think that Jesus would want everybody to know he's the Son of God, he's the Messiah, but there's this secrecy. Mark portrays Jesus maintaining this element of secrecy about himself in the work. Scholars call it the messianic secret. And it applies not just to the miracles that Jesus doesn't want anybody to know about, but it also applies to his identity. After Jesus heals in chapter 1, he sternly warns them, see to it that none of you say anything to anyone. When Jesus raises a child from the dead in chapter 5, he orders that no one should know this. After Jesus heals a deaf man in chapter 7, he orders them to tell no one. What's going on here? Jesus also commands the disciples to be quiet about who he is. In chapter 8, Jesus asks them, hey, who do you say, wh- wh- who do you say that I am? Who do you say? Oh, well, then the answer. Peter says, you are the Messiah. And what, <laughs> and what does Jesus do? He sternly orders them not to tell anyone. Jesus gives private instruction, but only to a few people. And he teaches in parables. Why? In order to confuse people. What? Yeah. Chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. He deliberately hides his intent from the crowds. Jesus says, everything comes in parables. In order that they may indeed look, but not perceive. And may indeed listen, but not understand. So that they may turn again not turn again and be forgiven. Now, what's going on here? Why wouldn't Jesus want the crowds to understand and be forgiven? The irony is, even the disciples, the privileged insiders, the ones who are told many secrets, regularly fail to understand what's going on with Jesus. In today's text, the disciples not only don't really understand who Jesus is. They don't even know where he is at this point. He sneaks out before dawn. And this won't be the first time in Mark's gospel that Jesus tries to keep secret his whereabouts. Can we blame Jesus for wanting to sneak off in the cover of darkness to pray? After all, Mark says, that evening at sundown, They brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. Wow. How would you like a crowd of sick and demon-possessed people hanging around your front door at night? It sounds like a horror movie to me. And honestly, I don't watch horror movies uh, ever since high school, really. I watched an Alfred Hitchcock uh, psycho movie. Did anybody see that back in the day? Yeah, scared the living daylights out of me. And uh, I'll tell you what, my brother, who you think is so sweet and kind, the pastor that came and preached a couple of weeks ago in the contemporary worship service, I'll tell you about my brother. <laughs> he found out how paranoid I was to take showers after I watched that movie. The murder scene where the guy's stabbing the woman in between the curtain, right? Yeah, he took full advantage of that as any teenage brother would. And we had the kind of bathroom doors that with the little hole in the knob that you could stick a, a, a hairpin through and open it. And I'm telling you, he was quick. I'd be taking a shower with one eye open and all of a sudden the door opened, he'd scream and I'd, my arms would flail. And Yeah, you laugh now, but I'm telling you, that, that, that plastic curtain did not survive. It is possible 
to, uh, you know, I no longer have to do this, wa- wash my hair with my eyes open in the shower. But I know it's possible. Uh, I, if you're going to do it, uh, use the Johnson's baby shampoo. That, 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 that works. Now, I don't blame Jesus for taking off when sick and demon-possessed, scary-looking people show up in the, in the dark on his front door. I don't blame him. You and I might escape out of fear. I don't think that's why Jesus snuck out, honestly. I think Jesus escapes for a higher purpose. And I say this because Mark says, In the morning, while it is still very dark, Jesus gets up and goes out to a deserted place, and there he prays. That's why he left. He needed help. He needed to connect with God. Jesus' disciples hunt him down, and they say, Hey, Jesus, stop that, you know. There are the cartoons that I see of a pastor praying in his office, and the secretary comes in, knocks on the door, and says, Oh, good, you're not busy doing anything important. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, they're saying, Jesus, let's get out of here. Let's go and, you know, we got to go back and, and help all these people. They, they want you to heal them. And Jesus says, uh, No, let's go on to the neighboring towns because I need to preach. After all, that's what I came to do. Can you imagine their reaction? What is your reaction to that? Sweet, loving, compassionate, kind, healing Jesus says, uh, let all those people that need healing, uh, good luck to them. We need to move on. Wow. How would you feel if you had some personal issue? You had some great pain in your life and you you called up Pastor Jody or or me and said, hey, uh, uh, I need your help. I said, oh, sorry, I'm preaching this Sunday. I'm going to be busy all week writing my sermon Good luck with all your personal problems. What's going on here? Is preaching more important to Jesus than healing? Why does Jesus run from the crowds instead of encouraging them to gather and be healed? I don't know. Mark rarely explains things. He simply reports what happens And leaves us hanging with questions. Why is Jesus so secretive? Why does he want the crowds not to understand who he is? Why doesn't he heal everybody? I mean, these are people who are seeking him. Like the beautiful song we we heard, you know, time after time. If you're lost, you know, I'll be there. Really? It doesn't sound like it right here. How can he run away to preach elsewhere? What message could be so important that you leave all those people at your front door in need? Now, way back in chapter 1, Mark revealed what Jesus was preaching. Jesus said things like, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom or the reign of God has drawn near. Repent and believe in the gospel. What in the world did that mean? to the first people to hear it. Well, glad you asked. I think we can speculate what it might have meant because back in the first century Mediterranean world, the kingdom belonged to Caesar. Caesar. And the gospel, euangelion, the good news, well, that was all about the good news of peace, Pax Romana, The peace that Caesar provided. And how did Caesar provide that peace? Well, much like we're trying in the Red Sea right now. Through through might. Through military force. Through fear. Through intimidation. Terror. Now, it did have an upside. Pax Romana. It put an end to civil war. And it brought prosperity to the elite, and some of it, that wealth trickled down to a few in the empire. So good on them. The masses were expected to be grateful and overlook the corruption. Just overlook it. Overlook the lies. Overlook the arrogance. I know this sounds impossible to us, 
We postmodern, enlightened people would never tolerate such character flaws in our leaders. But in Jesus' day, the masses show blind allegiance to Caesar, whose ego is so big. How big was it? (laughs) That he thought himself as the Son of God. He thought himself to be divine. Now, against this propaganda-drenched background, Jesus enters preaching that the kingdom does not belong to that guy. The kingdom belongs to God. And God's kingdom has drawn near. So, friends, this important, urgent preaching that Jesus had to go off and do was politically loaded. And Jesus felt compelled to be able to say, repent, Jesus says, turn and see what God is doing. God has a totally different understanding of peace and how peace is brought about in the world. A new way of loving, a new way of serving, a new way of understanding, a new way of forgiving. Truly, peace is possible, but not this way. Not through fear and corruption and military might. Jesus slips away from healing to preaching the good news because there's still so much that needs to be proclaimed and difficult choices need to be made. Do I do help them or do I go and do what God's called me to do? What, do I people please over here or do I do what I, is most important for me to do? It's not easy. Jesus, can't, Jesus himself can't be all things to all people. How dare we as a church think we can be? Saying no to good things in order to say yes to the most important things is painful, but it's a, but it's a necessary function of a mission-driven church. You just can't keep saying yes to everything. Jody coined it with our top leaders in the church. She said, we need to do less better. And I think she's right. Surely Jesus knows that people will follow anybody, almost anywhere, who gives them what they want. But crowds of needy people chasing after a Santa Claus version of God is really, that, that, that kind of folk, they're not really going to help build the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, right? I mean, Jesus needed to invest in disciples who were like the deacons, willing to serve, eager to serve. Disciples who could hear the truth about his identity and mission and act on it faithfully and courageously. Next Sunday, we'll read about the transfiguration. Jesus will order his disciples again. They're coming down off the mountain after this big, amazing light show. And, uh, and he said, don't tell anybody. Until after he's risen from the dead. Oh, there's our hint. There's our clue to this messianic secret. Don't tell anybody until. Perhaps this is the reason Jesus keeps his identity and power hidden. He knows that people are not going to get it until, like this mother-in-law that's raised up, he too is raised up. Friends, as we stumble after Jesus... Sometimes seeing clearly and sometimes not knowing what in the world is going on. The point isn't to have all the answers and how arrogant it would be of me to stand up here with my degrees and claim to have all the answers. I don't. The point is, though, to hear the good news. God's reign is at hand. Can we hear that? And here's another part of that good news. You and I have a role to play in advancing God's reign on earth as it is in heaven. Maybe it's swinging a hammer for Habitat House. Maybe if you're a child and you're not old enough, 16 yet, you can make that sign that welcomed the new family into their new home. When Jesus heals Simon Peter's mother-in-law, she serves him out of gratitude. Not a bad response for us. Think about it. Yes, it's important to seek understanding. But ultimately, Jesus doesn't call us to understand all the mysteries and wonders of God. Instead, Jesus calls us to repent and to follow him, for a new kingdom is at hand. A kingdom not built on fear, 
Imagine that. A nation not in the grip of fear. A kingdom not corrupt by corrupt power. A kingdom not built on violence and egomaniacs, but a kingdom built on the power of love. What a concept. This love has touched us, has it not? It's touched us intimately in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus, we Christians, many of us like to say, is the incarnation, incarne, carne, flesh, the enfleshed, the embodiment of God's love. That's a sobering thought. That's a sobering thought. Because as we follow Jesus, we incarnate that same love to the world. And friends, there are people in your sphere of influence and mine in which we are the only Jesus they will ever encounter. Birds of a feather tend to flock together. We're the only Bible that some of our friends will ever read. And God's love has touched us. God's brought healing to our lives on so many levels. And it's time now for us to rise up. Rise up and serve. And those who do will find their life. Don't take my word for it. That's what Jesus says. (laughs) Those who lose their life for Christ's sake and the sake of the kingdom will find it and advance God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for the love you have brought into our lives through the people in our lives that have embodied your love to us, whether it's a Diane Carter role modeling what it means to be an incredible servant uh, or a Sunday school teacher or a parent or a grandparent and all the love that they've poured into us, whether it's a good friend who has a listening ear when we're in times of trouble, time after time, time after time, you have been there for us out of gratitude, God. May we be there for a hurting, troubled world. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.